Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the first line is empty. If you, someone wants to sit here, uh, I switch a uh, welcome to us, to all of us that uh, is now here in presence or online. Follow us uh, in the YouTube. Uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, our guest, the speaker of this evening, this afternoon. It's uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Olivia Livrini. Uh, Lovinia, uh, Olivia Livrini has his background in physics and uh, she's working for many decades in the area of uh, physics and science education. He is located, located in the uh, Department of Physics uh, and Astronomy Augusto Rigg uh, uh, at the University of Bologna. Uh, he, she was a very uh, renewed uh, uh, researcher in science education. She has organized the ESERA in 2019. Uh, it was a very big, a very interesting conference uh, at Ezera just before the pandemics. And uh, last year, she just finished uh, the coordination of a very big European project, Fedora project, that I hope she mentions something about this. Okay, uh, for this afternoon, uh, uh, Olivia will speak us uh, with one of the subjects of uh, your research. Uh, entitled uh, Futurizing Science Education for the Society of Acceleration and Uncertainty. Okay, Olivia, thank you very much to be here. This microphone. Does it work? Yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you, thank you very much, Mauricio, Hernani, and all the people who invited me here. As you know, it's a great pleasure because Brazil is really <laughs> a special place for, for me. It's the second time I'm here, and always I feel home, and it's a very, also very, very special, um, a, a very special uh, context to talk about science education and physics education with this broad scope uh, and also political, sociological uh, and philosophical implications. This is very rare, I think, in the world. And uh, I always find this place a sort of magic here. So let's move to the, uh, to the, uh, to the talk. This is the title that Mauricio already told. As uh, he told, uh, I come just, uh, I very briefly position myself just to introduce where I come from and where is my position. I, I come from Bologna. Bologna is uh, supposed to be the oldest university in the Western world. It was founded in, uh, established in uh, 1088. <laughs> and uh, I live in the department of, uh, I work in the department of physics and astronomy. This is the picture of my, of my department. And uh, in the department, there are many different research areas. So there is applied physics and complex systems, astrophysics, atmospheric physics, nuclear and subnuclear physics, physics education and history of physics, physics of condensed matter, atom and molecules, physics of the earth, theoretical physics. So we are one of the area of the research area of this big department. And uh, as uh, Mauricio um, told, I mean, I'm uh, in this, uh, I'm trying to lead, I have the, the honor to serve as a, to coordinate this little group, it is a little, but we have only we are uh, we are only three faculty members, but we I have four PhD students, a postdoc, and mainly this is the reason of this slide. We work very closely to with the secondary school teachers. So secondary school teachers are part of our research group, and um, we uh, tried. Uh, to, um, to apply, and we were successful to apply to, for uh, European projects. This was very important for us. And uh, we had the, the we, we could coordinate several projects. And the, the, the themes of this project are future literacy, embracing complexity system thinking. These are the themes of also the IC project, it was the first project that I coordinated. Another 
a project that I coordinated is called Identities, it's also finished, and the, the theme uh, were interdisciplinarity in STEM, pre-service teacher education, SEALS uh, was the project where we were partners, uh, and the themes were open schooling, sustainability models of change, and all these themes uh, converged into Fedora, the Fedora project, the last one, uh, that is just finished, uh, and it will be the topic of this, uh, this talk. Um, just to, to tell you something that is important also to, to position uh, our work is that we, we feel the pressure also of the European research programs and the themes uh, that Europe in this moment consider particularly important to orient the research in Europe. This is a, a very recent uh, competence framework for sustainability. And I just uh, put this slide here because you can see that the main themes here that Europe is pushing are complexity, values, futures, uh, and agency. So these are very hot themes in Europe. Uh, so today I will focus on uh, these uh, topics of future, but uh, for me, and, and I will focus in particular with the, to, on the Fedora project that just finished. Fedora is a sort of acronym of, for future-oriented science education to announce responsibility and engagement in the society of acceleration and uncertainty. It involved the different universities, like the University of Bologna, but also the Kaunas University of Technologies in Lithuania, the University of Helsinki, the University of Oxford, and also an association that is called Teach the Future, I will talk about this because they are people that who professionally work as futurists, people who are professionally have the professional abilities to build scenarios and also to think about how their competencies can be also teach, can be also taught in schools and among teachers, and also an agency for communication. I. I just made this long presentation because I think uh, it is important also to uh, characterize uh, our approach to physics education because we feel a lot uh, the push from schools, okay, the, and the, 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 the issues that teachers really feel in the real classes, this is, we feel this push, but we also feel very strongly uh, the pull from Europe and the themes uh, that uh, Europe consider priorities for them. And it is uh, always a very a challenge to try to align what is happening in the school, what, what the Europe try to orient us. And also it is rather a challenge to try to align these two big, two so far world staying within the physics department where we have to teach physics. So the challenge is how to regenerate and to think physics in order to address teachers' needs and in order to align schools' needs with European priorities. So this is a very big challenge, and this is something that characterizes a lot our approach and our method. So let's enter. Let's enter to the. Uh, let's enter the main topic of uh, today. Starting from the push, a push from the schools. So future is a, is a theme that we started to address almost 10 years ago, just because teachers of our, in, in our group from the classes complained and they felt that something was happening in their classes. And they started to feel in particular that for the students, uh, there was a big change in their perception of time and in their perception of the future. The teachers um, really started to talk with us about uh, the problem that uh, for the young students it was always very difficult to push the imagination forward. It was impossible to see the future. They didn't have an horizon. And if you don't have an horizon, a future horizon, also the present become fragmented and become, and this is how our teachers started to talk with us. They felt it, their students that to be, become very anxious um, when um, they had to make any kind of decisions, okay? And so uh, they, uh, and in particular, their reaction to the events and to the fact was just oriented, they were totally oriented toward sizing the moment, sniffing out every opportunity and keeping open all possible scenarios. So the present became 
frenetic and a collection of events. This is how the teachers thought uh, about their students. So we started to think and to read and to shop around just to see if it was just a local situation or if it was something that was much more general, if it was a social, a social issue. And this is when we met Harmut Rosa and uh, the, the book uh, uh, of this, on the Society of Acceleration. And we started to think about uh, what uh, actually uh, Topper <laughs> top uh, mentioned by future shock. They were uh, describing that indeed our era is characterized by exactly what future shock. What does it mean, future shock? It means that the rate of change is so fast that we don't have the time and the, to, to think about what is happening. And, uh, and this happens in particular to the schools because the society is getting faster and faster and the, the society is changing very quickly. But our schools and our university, our social systems have inner inertia, inner velocity that are not able to keep the pace of change. And so we started to observe this kind of disalignment, disalignment between the velocity of society and the velocity of what happens in the schools. We started from, from here. And uh, also, we started to, to think about, um, to, to, try to, uh, 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 to try to describe the student's uh, perception of uh, present and student perception of, uh, of students' way to deal with their daily life. And uh, in reading uh, uh, Armut Rosa, also we found uh, that um, Walter Benjamin, also at the beginning of 20th century, so uh, he uh, used the, he reflected about the different uh, German words to talk about uh, episodes of present. In the German, in Germany, there are in German there are two different words to to describe episodes of the present. The first one is Erlebnissen. Erlebnissen means that um, they describe uh, episodes of mere experience. They are events that uh, seem to pass very slowly, okay, but they, they don't have any impact on the construction of an identity. You forget them very, very quickly. These are Erlebnissen. Instead, uh, there are also Erfahrungen. Instead, they are events that seem to pass very quickly, but that they, they are events and moments in your life that have a, a strong impact on the construction of your identity or your sense of the self. And the, already in the Benjamin, at the beginning also of the 19th century, uh, complained that also one century ago, uh, they, the era, and they were approaching an era of uh, rich of Erlebnissen and poor of Erfahrung. Today, instead, we are in a so quick and so uh, uh, quick and fast society that actually Rosa said that we are experiencing a world of short, short episodes. We are full of events, and it is very difficult for all of us, but in particular for the students, just to think about what are the events that are important for them, how to make a decision, and how to create a, a, a structure, in the, also in the, in the sense of the present. So if you don't have a vision of the future and your present <laughs> become uh, very fragmented, we are in front, actually, in a very change, a generational change in our perception of the time with respect to the classical modernity. Because this means that uh, we are running and running just to keep some the pace, but we are losing a sense of direction. We are losing a sense of progress. We are losing a sense of real change. And this is uh, how they, they call the frenetic stand, standstill. And this is really something that is challenging our collective perception of the, of the time with respect to the modern, the sense classical modernity. So our teachers <laughs> were describing a situation that was very serious, very deep. They were not just complaining. They were describing something very important. And there's something that was also uh, even more serious, because uh, uh, this perception of time uh, was uh, creating, also had some implication of an identity 
level and also at the level of the re social relationship. Uh, always uh, Armos uh, Rosa describe uh, this link and this implication between the sense of time, the sense of identity and social relationship in this sense. He is uh, describing as a, an impact of this acceleration as alienation from time. He describes, he uses, he uses this uh, word to, to tell this uh, sense, this feeling that almost all of us feel that we are running, uh, running, and just um, uh, we are trying to pursue objectives and to follow practices that actually not always we want to do, but we feel that we have to do just because we are following something, okay? So we are alienated for, from time. But also, this is producing alienation from the self and alienation from the others, because actually our sense of ourself and our relationship is really also derives from actions and from experiences that uh, uh, are situated in a, in, a, in a social and a material world and also in a sort of space-time fabric. So also our sense of self has an inner space-time structure, also the, our relationship with, with the others. So this is uh, just uh, our initial analysis, okay, of uh, just to interpret what the teachers were talking about. And so we started to ask, okay, but what does this reflection has to do with, uh, uh, with science teaching in our classes? What can we do in our classes? We are physics education researchers. We are, what, what, what is the relationship with this situation in the society and our job? And what manifestations of the society of acceleration can be noticed in science physics school classes? I mean, in more, more, much more details with respect to what the teachers were talking about. And is it possible, does it make sense to rethink science? There is room in science teaching and in physics teaching to do something about this situation and to, to try to use physics teaching and science teaching as a source of knowledge and skills to help the young generation and help all of us to navigate this fast-changing society. So it, they were very ambitious and very complex uh, questions, but we try to, to find a way to, to address them. So in the, um, this is the, I mean, I, I thought to, to organize the talk according to this uh, outline. I, um, first of all, I would like to, to present you some results from studies that we carried out uh, or that have been carried out on a student's perception uh, and conception of future and time and um, that were both before and after the pandemic. We started to think about future and time before the pandemics, but pandemics was really, really, really a moment, special moment also for our time structure, okay? So it was a very particular moment. So I will present you some results of these studies, and then I will give you some design principles, the principles that we try to point it out in order to rethink about science teaching and physics teaching in order to deal with these uh, issues, and then some results from our implementations. So before starting, just a, is it something that you have a feeling of? I'm talking about something that is too dramatic. <laughs> just to... Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's move to the first part uh, in this about students' perception and conception of future and time. So in uh, Fedora, we had a work package that was led by the University of uh, Helsinki by Antti Laerto, who was mentioned this uh, this morning, and uh, he um, led this work package about just to, to carry out these studies in order to to investigate students' perception of time and student perception of future. And uh, the papers that was mentioned this morning was also part of this uh, investigations. And uh, during, um, and uh, in, uh, in Fedora, we uh, studied, uh, we made different part studies in order to try to investigate students' perception of the future and also a desk research on future in, in order to see if uh, the textbook and its curricula all over Europe that somehow touched to this um, referred to this future or uh, time uh, issues. 
And the, in order, uh, the results of these uh, investigations that were uh, through questionnaire, they were uh, uh, through interviews, uh, and they were um, mm, sum up in, uh, they were condensed and they were expressed in terms of issues, okay, that uh, the students perceive in terms of with respect to time and, and future and uh, and the, one of them was uh, strongly related to the relationship between time and technologies because uh, the, the perception of the future for students is strongly strongly related also to their perception of technologies because technology is conceived, conceived as a sort of tool for making the future uh, but there are other issues related just to the perception of time or in general and also some issues related to the educational policies and uh, on the basis of these issues also the, the group prepared some recommendation in order to impact the, the teaching but also poli policy policy uh, uh, policy um, actions uh, and stuff like that. Today, uh, if you if you want, you can uh, you can uh, find this deliverable. Uh, there is a detailed description of all these issues. I today I would like just to to mention some of these results that are very important also for the implication on teaching in the classes. This is the focus my, of my talk. And in particular, I um, I would uh, like to, to introduce you to uh, uh, two results that are particularly worrying for me. One is what we call the, the polarization and linearization attitude, also according to time and about future. And the second one is uh, the tendency to search for simple solutions of to, to build safe bubbles, also time bubbles in, in this sense. I will describe this to the first one, but I just want to, to mention that indeed it is very well known in the literature what is called the two-track thinking, two ways of thinking. And there is this polarization. If you think about future in terms of personal future, or if you think about future in terms of a collective, a social future, there is a completely different attitude. Because if the students uh, think about their personal future, I'm, I'm just thinking very generally, but this is a tendency. Uh, they tend to activate a sense of uh, control, a bias, illu the illusion of control, and the, the illusion that they have the chance to control their career and to control their personal way to, to, to get. Instead, if they think about collective future, there is a very dystopic view and the idea that really the future is much worse than the present, and, this, uh, and, there, is this, and the, there is nothing a lot to do, okay? They feel this sense of agency. They don't have the sense of agency in their, in the collective and in the social future. So this is called two-track thinking about the future, and it is one of the other manifestation of this polarization between individual and collective. Also, this is the topic that we talked to today, and it is uh, something that emerged very, very uh, quick, very, very often in uh, in uh, in the way of dealing with this, these big issues among the, the young generation, but not only among them. So let's, uh, I would like to describe uh, a little bit more in detail these two different, uh, these two different results by referring to uh, some study that we carried out during the, the pandemic. During the pandemic, uh, where uh, um, the pandemic, of course, was a very complicated moment. It was a very complex uh, a very complex uh, phenomenon that touched all the, all the society. In, in, but um, for us, we were thinking about time. We were, so we decided to analyze the pandemics also through the lens of time. This is a study that we carried out and we just wanted to see the change in the space-time fabric that was occurring during the pandemic. This is... Uh, this is very typical also from the sociology of time, the idea that when there is a dramatic event, one of the main changes is of, of course also at the level of the daily rituals and in the level of the perception of time. So we decided to, to follow Hartmut Rosa, the sociology of time, and you use time as a sociological construct, I mean as a, a way to read, to read the interactions, social interaction, cultures, institution, and power dynamics, because they can be analyzed. This is a, was a discovery for us. They can be analyzed for their temporal structure, like rituals, images of the future, and relation with the past. So during the pandemic, we um, we decided to take this perspective. Indeed, if you think about the pandemic through the lens of time. Uh, 
you could observe differ so many different velocity and perception of time. The social and the global time was um, very, very, was accelerated, was accelerated because of this natural phenomenon, because of the virus. And we were witnesses, uh, we observed the dynamic of all the social institutions, like the policy of system, educational system, economics, that tried to, 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 to run as quickly as possible to slow down the speed of the pandemic. And we remember flattening the curve, just running, just running to flattening the curve. There's, we were observing this society accelerating and accelerated because it, they, they, they had to try to address this so impressive problem. And on the other hand, during the lockdown, we were in our personal bubble where we were had to reorganize our daily life ritual in a sort of present, in a sort of present shock where we had to reorganize ourselves just in this bubble of present, just to dealing with, just to dealing with our very simple daily routines. So if you look at pandemic through the times, you observe this strong misalignment. And for us, it was very interesting because indeed, the pandemic and also this personal way to live, the pandemic was a way to disclosure, to disclosure some time structure that uh, and pieces also that uh, during normal time were invisible or they were not important. So they were just part of this. So in this moment, we decided to involve some students, of secondary students, to try to understand and to, to interview them about how they were living their daily life routine. In particular, we were interested, they were very good students in uh, physics and in mathematics. They were secondary school students. This is not a statistical group. We, we wanted very good students because uh, we wanted to understand if uh, they were using, uh, how they used uh, also their learning, and their scientific knowledge uh, to deal with their daily life routine. This was just a very generic question that we had, but it was very interesting to interview them and to try to understand what was happening and if science, physics learning was playing some role okay, in this moment to managing time and to managing this dramatic situation. That was our question. And uh, indeed, what we, what, we, what we found was that indeed uh, we were in a very strange situation because instead of being in a future shock, we, they were experiencing a present shock. Just they had to deal with this, this very special moment. And uh, in some sense, also through the interviews, we observed that instead, instead of experiencing a sense of alienation of time, there was the problem of reappropriating of time. Just to rearrange their daily life routine, routine indeed, to search for a sense of agency and a sense of directionality. So they were trying to reorganize their daily life routine in order to, to however, continue their life and however to think about uh, how to prepare for their personal careers uh, to, and not to, to lose too much, to lose opportunity or stuff like that. So they, in some sense, uh, they activated the very specific uh, knowledge and skills in order to rearrange uh, their daily life. It was, but what was very interesting for us and somehow shocking was that, uh, again, again, we noticed a very strong polarization between uh, the personal and the social dimension. All daily life routine, even if, I mean, it was a very spe special moment because you could observe science in its making. You could observe society in its making. It was a sort of open-air lab. You could observe the methodology. Instead, they, they were very good students in, in science and math and, 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 and in physics. But instead, their attention was just to take care of themselves and just to think about their personal future, not to lose the opportunity as future for their future success as professional. So they, and, and also, uh, we, were, we were also very impressed because the, for these students, they're not statistical. This is not a statistical, but it's just a, a fee, it's something that happened is, but also for um, another thing that we observed is that mathematics as physics and physics for them 
was very important because it was perceived as a sort of safe bubble because of the sense of certainty, because of the sense that it was something that didn't change. Also in this changing world, there was a bubble of where nothing was changing, and that was the exercise on integrals and very big exercise of math because that was a sense of, of, uh, of um, something that didn't change. So also in this case, we could notice this trend. It was already very well known. So the two-track thinking, this polarization, and also this tendency of searching for safe bubbles. And mathematics and physics for these students became the way to search for these safe bubbles. Okay, so we uh, went on and we also decided to try to uh, to, to carry out follow-up uh, studies in the post-pandemic uh, uh, period and to see if uh, it was possible to investigate the students' perception of time, how they uh, also when they came back to, to school, and we, we, um, this became a sort of obsession for us to see their perception of, of time. And, um, and in the post-pandemic uh, period, uh, also, uh, I was, uh, I, I observed this other phenomenon in particular for, uh, among the physics students in our bachelor uh, degree, so the, the students of the first of first years of the of physics, they were the students who experienced the pandemic in the last years of their uh, of their secondary schools, and uh, I started to collect uh, very impressive uh, storytelling about how they were living uh, the learning of physics. Okay, because other two fears became rather evident for these students who experienced the pandemic. Actually. Um, they started to, to complain uh, the relationship with physics uh, and in particular with a very hyper-specialization attitude in physics uh, in, our, in our courses because uh, they in some moments started to fear that uh, they conceived the learning physics as a sort of uh, tunnel, as a sort of uh, silos. They, they perceived the silos effect that hyper-specialization of physics after pandemic because a way to cut too much, okay? The relationship with their learning with the rest of the, of the, um, of the, of the life. <laughs> so in some sense, they felt it to be, uh, to be guided into a tunnel in some sense. And on the other sense, uh, they were uh, feeling and they were expressing uh, a sense uh, of getting lost in the world because the learning in the disciplines became actually so sophisticated but so technical that they didn't have, they didn't find in the learning in the disciplines the tools to navigate the science. So the silos effect and the fog effect became something very difficult in this uh, in, in this moment. So we are um, trying to understand uh, uh, what is happening uh, now and uh, we are uh, investigating this uh, the, we are asking the students also to tell about their daily routine and how they experience uh, physics learning and we are developing a new lens for analyzing the time structure that uh, uh, students use in order to describe the perception of time. And we use as a lens the distinction between external time and internal time by Ilya Prigozhin. He was a Nobel Prize and, and, um, and he worked in, uh, in complex systems uh, far from the equilibrium. Also, he was mentioned uh, yesterday. And uh, he makes this distinction between uh, external time or chronological time. Uh, the time is the time of physics, the time of the clock, the Newtonian time, the time that characterized modernity, the, uh, the classical modernity. It uh, described the events and the process in the physical world by organizing the events on a, on a, through a conventional, uh, conventional structure. And uh, it is the time of the clock. It is the time that is quantified by measuring it using clocks and calendars. It, it is a linear way to um, to sign to mark the, the the time, it is linear, regular, ordered, and it is conceived as a continuous progression. 
And in this case, uh, the events don't the events don't change time. Time is something that uh, is there; it's external to the to the to the event. On the other hand, instead, uh, there is uh, the, what Prigozhin called the internal time, that is the time of the experience. It is the time that has also some chirological moment. It is describes some temporal behavior of complex systems that are not in equilibrium. There is some internal dynamics that determine the time evolution of these, uh, of these uh, systems. And uh, these, um, these systems also, uh, activity patterns and behaviors, that are not simply predictable in terms of the initial condition. This is not something that is predictable in terms of external condition, but it's something that is also uh, refers to inner dynamics of the, of the systems. And it captures the notion that uh, these systems exhibit their own inner temporal order that emerge as a result of this internal dynamics and in this uh, in this open system in the interaction between the systems and the environment in this uh, in this open and uh, also this is very important because in this um, dynamic internal dynamics of complex systems also there is a special role for contingency for a specific moment and uh, this can create some discontinuity and this can create uh, produce new form of order, new, the emergency of new form of equilibrium, new form of, of order. And so there are some moments that are the chirological moment, the Leibniz moment, that, um, the Farugan moment, that determine also qualitative change in the stuff. So we use the, we imported, we use this general structure in terms of markers in order to analyze some uh, written essays from the students uh, just to, 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 to see how they describe the time, the, the time and how they feel the time. And um, indeed, uh, um, now I'm talking about uh, um, just very preliminary results. Uh, I, I'm not very detailed here in describing the methodology, but because we are doing it it is a, a, a work that is uh, going on in this moment. There is a, a master's student who is doing her thesis on that. But uh, we are using uh, this general distinction as markers to analyze written essays from secondary school students, but also interviews from university students, the students that I mentioned before that have that kind of feeling with respect to the disciplines. And we are finding <laughs> At the end of the talk, there are some happy ends, okay? So, <laughs> but in this in this moment, also we are we are discovering that indeed, um, uh, when there is a sense of um, discomfort, a sense of uh, uh, problem to be addressed, also also in learning physics, in learning at university and secondary school. The problem is somehow conceptualized as a problem of making a better plan at the level of external time. So there is a problem of, to, to, there is the tendency to address anxiety and the problem of aligning with the, 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 pro, the personal learning, just thinking, just trying to optimize time planning, just to organize, try to split what they call lifetime, work time, to, to improve planning, and just to act at the level of external time. Okay, And when uh, uh, there is another kind of illusion, the kind of illusion that in order to pursue well-being as a student, also the illusion that uh, one can create a myth about personal times in terms of just uh, dreaming to live in a very far place where there is no job, no work, no pressure from society, just uh, the time of life that is not very completely different from work. So the, the idea, the delusion that a very a sense of issues with times can be addressed acting at the level of external time or just trying to have um, personal time far from society or far from and um, and in, in, in what is also uh, uh, worrying for me is that in some sense this attitude instead of addressing the problem of alienation for time they can contribute also to 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 uh, to, to to increase this sense of alienation of time and uh, because in any case, uh, there is not this perception and there is not uh, an attention to take care 
of the internal time, uh, in, 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 the, the internal time, in particular, Mm. And this uh, this uh, circle, vicious circus, is because there is uh, in this moment there is uh, an increasing uh, uh, phenomenon of burning out, uh, quiet quitting, uh, an increasing sense uh, of uh, uh, the identity is strongly fragmented, uh, and also uh, also we are noticing that also the the relation with the others instead of being uh, a source of new energy, <laughs> it becomes another sense of. Um, Another, uh, it, it, it's another source for depression. So, and in particular, this is the point where we are acting at the level. Now we are, I'm moving to the rest. Uh, the problem is that, in some sense, there are difficulties to take care of internal time and its alignment with external commission, in particular, to cultivate what Virginia Woolf called the moment of being, or what they were their epiphany of joy. So, the moment of erfaring. Uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin mentioned also <laughs> Christiana told about also hiatus, this discontinuities in uh, in uh, in, uh, in external time that are the moment of regeneration, the time of where the sense of the self and the sense of uh, uh, the trajectory of identity can come out. So these are very important moments that unfortunately. This is the uh, unfortunate our school systems and our teaching don't take care because our systems, our schools are still very organized in this sense of a very rigid, chronological, modern structure of time where the students are guided to follow all the same piece of learning just to split learning in terms of external moment and the calendar and the hour. Instead, uh, we are living in a liquid, accelerated, uncertainty, risk-based society where the dynamics of time is something very complicated. And in our schools, at, at least in our schools, there are not moment to cultivate the moment of being, the moment of uh, epiphanies and the moment of uh, erlangs. So. This is our analysis, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, and where we uh, the, the analysis of society and the question is how, what can we do in our school? Okay, is it possible to is it possible to rethink about science teaching in order to change also the space and time fabric? and the structure of space and time in order to foster special way of uh, learning that is, uh, and uh, this is how we call the futurized science uh, education, and there are two basic ideas. The first uh, one is indeed, indeed uh, is that uh, mm, time is, uh, can be a social structure, and in this sense, it can be changed, and it can be, and it's something that can be uh, uh, adapted also to different uh, needs. But in particular, if we move to future, I mean, future thinking can be a way to rethink about our structure of time and to regenerate and to challenge our modern perception of time, that is this linear, uh, oriented to an, a bright, Future and the instance of instance of a progression, a linear progression toward a better and better future. Okay, and we we indeed found in future studies and in this study a, a possible way to rechange and to rethink about our uh, structure, time structure. And the other idea is that indeed physics and science is really a rich source of uh, concepts knowledge, words, model, structure, to talk about time in different ways, not only in a Newtonian time, Newtonian modern time, but there is a lot of rich, a lot of room in the bottom of, of, of science. And, uh, and in some sense, so there is space to do something. So uh, in, order to, uh, in order to challenge the modern, perception of time for our risk society, for our society of acceleration, we found indeed very, very inspirational and very useful um, 
the field that is called the futures studies. We didn't know about its existence until uh, some years uh, ago. Instead, future studies uh, is uh, an interdisciplinary field uh, that involves uh, sociologists, philosophers, historians, political scientists, psychologists, economists, and uh, they uh, are uh, investigating actually trend and other sources, patterns, and causes in order to develop foresight, to develop foresight, and to create possible, probable, desirable future scenarios. Okay. And um, what we learned in studying uh, future studies and this field is that, in, indeed, uh, when we talk about future thinking and we think about teach the future, we are not referring to a crystal ball. We are not able to see the future, OK? Of course, they are the, but the future is uh, a way of thinking, is a mindset, is a way of dealing with the problems. And it's a way to address and to organize yourself in order to deal with the problem. In particular, it is a practice also not for also to to, to try to also to ask to understand not only not only what happens, but also what can happen, what could happen. To try to educate ourselves in a sense of possibilities of something that can happen. It is also a way, a practice uh, to introduce in our thinking uh, the question, what if? And not only the question, what is, or what was, what is happening, what was happening, but what happened if something changes? It is uh, also a way to think and to imagine the future in terms of possibilities, not only one future, but in terms of possibilities. These possibilities can be uh, possible futures, but there are also plausible, some of, some of them can be much more desirable, but to think in terms of possibilities. And also to introduce in terms of possibility also the contingency thinking, the possibility that something can happen to create this, this equilibrium that can be the, the way to regenerate also, to create new meaning, to create new sense on what is happening. And also to, uh, to uh, think about the future means also to create a sense of horizon of possibilities that can orient you also to age, to act in the present, just because you have an orientation toward the future. This is their motto, describing alternative futures and empowering students to influence them, to think that the future is something that you can imagine in order to also try to act in a way to maximize the possibility, the probability to create your future. This is the this is the the, the cone. I don't know if it, it was. Uh, we, this is the one of the main uh, tool uh, that um, the futurists use in order to describe their sense of futures and to, the, to give the sense that for them futures is a plural. It's plural. It's not one future, but it's a sense of future. So the present is uh, on the left, and the futures are possible scenarios. Also, the concept of scenarios is something that is completely different from the sense of the past. It was only one. Instead of thinking about the scenarios, you are thinking of, uh, in, this, in these scenarios uh, also to think about the distinction between what are the probable, what are the possible, the plausible, and the desirable future. Also because in the future studies, they taught us, for example, different techniques. And they use different techniques to build probable scenarios to build plausible scenarios or to build desirable scenarios. Because as futurists, for example, if they have to, to build some probable scenario, what they do? They just analyze the present, analyze the past, and use typical trends from the pre past, the present, to the future, just to extrapolate something from the present to the future, just searching for the main trends that they can become important in the future. This is the probable future. But then if you introduce the sense of contingency, if you introduce the possibility of that something can happen, you move from probable to the possible scenarios in terms of you consider other possibilities that probably they are not so probable, but it doesn't matter, they can happen. Okay, just consider the contingency, not the main trend, but the little things that can happen and that can change the general uh, evolution of a society. Instead, if you, if you try to design desirable futures, 
they change completely the logic and the techniques to build this desirable future because they don't start from the present, they don't start from past, present to the future, but they do what they call foresight. Start, push your imagination in the future, think about the kind of futures that you want, the kind of problem that you want to, have to see solved, and then do what they call back casting. Think about what can happen in order to have that kind of. So this is a structure that can be used with the students to play with possible futures, also in, in order to activate different reasoning. Different reasoning just in terms of noticing the trend, considering contingencies, dealing with your desires, your possible futures in order to back casting and think about how you can contribute to having and to getting that scenarios. What is, uh, what is um, uh, interesting here is that uh, indeed this is, not, uh, uh, this is not considered as a tool just for mere speculation but for acting. Just, to, to, just for acting and to have a conscious action agency also in the future. So also action competence is something that is conceived part of this back and forth dynamics from the future to the present and vice versa. What was interesting for us is that this is a field in an interdisciplinary field that is used uh, in order to support policy makers, to support the business, in order to make this uh, possible plans or to consider the future. But actually, it is based on scientific concept. This is based on our, uh, um, it, it is based on, uh, on uh, how science model, we create models, simulation, create models uh, for, uh, for the futures. So the question is, why we don't rethink about teaching, physics teaching and science teaching, in order to use scientific knowledge just as a, a background, as a, as a conceptual and epistemological resource to, 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 to develop this kind of, uh, also this kind of competencies in the students. And uh, we discovered that indeed that there is a lot of space in, the, in our classes because even if uh, time is one of the main concepts in physics, for example, we, we don't teach a lot of time. And at the end of physics classes and the end of physics at the secondary school level in particular, the perception of time is just used as a way to measure, just the clock time. It's just a, a, a way to, to measure. It's a, it's a, it's the time of the clock. It's not a structure of thinking. So there is a lot of a lot of space because um, actually, actually uh, uh, in, in school, okay, because um, of course uh, our as I already anticipated, I mean uh, our um, our uh, uh, physics classes and our schools is strongly based on this modern and Newtonian concept of time and we insist a lot about also the uh, not only on the um, at conceptual level but also at epistemological level uh, we insist a lot to, to to show the students and to convince students that if we know the initial condition then we have the law that allowed us to determine the future evolution of the system in a very certain way okay and this is the, the, the image that students usually have of time in physics uh, at second, secondary school level instead actually in physics uh, we has a lot of other time structure have been developed uh, uh, the quantum physics uh, where they introduce also a sense of probabilistic uh, the probability became ontological and the principle of su superposition become becomes the evolution of it is not just evolution of a state, but a superposition of possible states. Okay, and also in uh, the science of complex system, of course, it is so rich. We observe, we know also um, of um, vocabulary and also epistemological structure because uh, in physics we can find epistemic and logical uncertainty, superposition principles, sensitive dependence from the initial conditions, scenarios building, randomness, contingency, projection, standard determinist prediction, feedback, and circular causality and computational simulation, they are 
if we use the lens of time, they are just tools to deal with time, okay? It's just, just a way to pay attention to some concepts that are part of our teach. So, and um, so this is the, these are the, the two main ideas that we use in order to create this model, this approach that we call to futurize, okay, science education. The first uh, principle, and these are, I call them principles because we use them as a sort of orientation to design materials, to design teaching modules to be used in the classes, okay? So the first principle is uh, instead, instead to, 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 to stress, and to point out how science deals with time in uh, mechanics, thermodynamics, quantum physics, whatever, I mean, just, and, uh, to, and, to, and to teach and to guide the students to learn the physics concept related to future and related to time. So this means operationally just uh, to align in teaching physics uh, the scientific temporal pattern and causal model and, pro that, uh, and progressively complexify the concept of, th of time by introducing and enriching the vocabulary and the mathematical structure to conceptualize time in physics. This is the first idea. The second, the second principle is uh, actually to add a sort of epistemological layer and to think that uh, indeed on the concept of space and the concept of time were object also of philosophical debate, epistemological debate, and just to introduce a critical level to talk about, about time. And also, so for example, uh, to, to, to think and to, 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 to use also time and uh, sp space and time as a way to think about what is science, what is the sense of the model, what is the values that are embedded in the models of, of science, like certainty, determinism, uncertainty, or, st or stuff like that. So add a critical layer to talk and to discuss about the time that he used in physics. The third layer is uh, related to another principle that is indeed uh, just uh, to incorporate in some moment specific activities that are inspired by, by future thinking, by future studies, just to, to introduce also some, um, yeah, some specific activities to play with the cone of that I presented and just to, to play and to imagine about what does it mean to foresight, to broadcasting and to introduce this, this, this layer of thinking in order to so if, I don't know if you noticed, but we moved from science and time as a scientific content, okay, to time as an epistemological theme, just to act as some critical thinking, to a layer that moves from science to epistemology to thinking, and just to try to use these tools to turn epistemology into thinking, into a way of thinking, into a way of reasoning and to explore what you are learning in the school to analyze what is happening outside the school. So from concept to epistemology to thinking, this is a, a progressive uh, layer. In, uh, in this, um, in Fedora, the, our colleagues that come from the future studies produced this um, tool that uh, it is called the uh, Future Oriented Science Education Manifesto. That is um, useful for the teachers because uh, uh, it, um, it is a sort of, uh, a sort of um, a, I don't know how to say, a, a, a catalog of possible activities that can be done in order to introduce uh, this uh, language of the future studies and the language of the futurist. For us, it is very important if uh, it is placed and situated within this much more complex situation in order not to activate only behavior, but also to think the, the scientific roots and the epistemological roots of this way of acting and way of behaving, of this kind of view. And um, finally, um, finally, uh, this the further layer is uh, to try to use all this different layered knowledge to become to get agency and to become and to think about possible actions that root into the science became critical thinking and became thinking and then are also and also become possible to become agent of your future
this is the a, a what we call it, a sort of complexification of the structure that uh, what helps students to see that what they learn in physics in the physics classes can be important for them not only as uh, not only as a persons individuals but also as citizens part of a much of a bigger community so this is the, just the, the list of the principles that i already introduced here concretely how long does it Ah, okay, okay. I, I can finish so we can we can talk. Just I would like to, to show you examples, okay? We use the, this structure of um, design principles. Uh, uh, according to these the principles, we designed the different modules, okay? Uh, we started to design this, I mean, this was, <laughs> we follow a DBR approach in the sense that it is uh, almost 10 years that we try to start developing and change and to, uh, to implement them uh, and to analyze the implementation and to see what happens and just to refine them in the class and blah, blah, blah. So, and we used uh, this structure to design uh, modules for secondary school students on climate change, artificial intelligence, quantum computers and secondary quantum revolution, simulation of complex systems. So as you notice, uh, these are STEM, we call them STEM topics. They are not curricular topics in Italy. So we started from uh, this uh, uh, sort of context because uh, it was uh, for us, because, okay, because uh, we, in, in Bologna, in Italy in general, we have uh, the opportunity to organize uh, uh, afternoon courses for secondary school students where we have much more the freedom uh, to, to do our uh, modules and to teach. And, and these are topics that are very important for them. So I am talking about this, but now we are in the moment where we are trying to implement and to enter these topics and this structure at the level of curricular topics and this is also another story that can be described because this is a very interesting process how to to come from outside school to inside school and the kind of institutional change that this kind of approach is producing and the change in the relationship among the teachers in the relationship of the of the school as an institution is creating this is something that we are doing now but now i present you some examples uh, of uh, this uh, um, non-curricular topic, okay? Um, this is the structure of the of the module. This is the, the basic structure that is a, a way, oops, the door. This is a structure that implements the different uh, principles. Uh, um, the first uh, part of the module, the gray one, is, um, is, a, is a moment of the module where uh, the students uh, are guided to enter the theme, uh, enter the scientific topic. I'm using now the conceptual, uh, the, the climate change module in order to illustrate the example, uh, the, the structure of the model. So for example, in this, in this case, in the case of, uh, of climate change, is a moment where uh, the students are introduced to the big uh, theme of uh, climate change, also to think about climate as a complex system and to see the multidimensional climate of climate change, and also to introduce uh, in, in general sense also what is, uh, what is future thinking. So this is uh, just a, a very brief introduction, overview of the module. And then, uh, okay, and then uh, there is the inner part, the, gray, uh, the green part, that is the much more scientific part. It is the part uh, that is uh, uh, typical lab activities where uh, the students are guided to practice or to encounter some conceptual tool uh, and the content knowledge uh, and also the from an epistemological point of view for example um, for example uh, in the in one of the case of the climate change uh, they try to to, to model uh, what is uh, for example, what is the process of uh, interaction between radiation and matter? What is the, the phenomenon of absorption? Why the change in the atmospheric uh, composition uh, is producing uh, an increase, an increase uh, in, uh, in, the, in the temperature at the surface of the Earth and stuff like that, just this lab model. The most important, uh, one of the important uh, moments of the module is this um, part. This, this is instead where 
the uh, instead where the uh, the typically uh, the science of complex the basic idea of complex systems uh, are introduced to the students and this is the epistemological moment where the uh, where the linear structure of time and the, the reductionist determinist perspective of Newtonian physics is challenged through introducing new concepts like uh, the concept of agents and emergent properties, non-linearity, non just moving from a linear causality to a sense of feedback loop and to introduce the circular causality. And um, through um, this is also a moment where, in particular, we, we use the agent-based simulation also in order to introduce the concept of what is agent, what is the system, what is this mechanism of emergent properties of stuff like that. So this is a moment where, from an epistemological point of view, we guide the student to get aware that we are here in front of a change of the perspective to analyze a time evolution in a system. It is a poss there are poss other possibilities. And this is also a moment uh, uh, This is very interesting uh, for us because uh, mm, this is an activity that was particularly successful since the beginning. <laughs> we um, used the, the, a piece from the IPCC report, uh, the, Inter the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change report for policymakers. We took some uh, part of this and we uh, wrote it. I mean, it is a simplified version of that. And uh, we uh, invited the students to try to understand and to analyze this uh, report uh, in terms uh, of um, um, just in order to, to stress that uh, also reading is not a linear way of analyzing, just that reading requires to apply some perspective of complexity. And in particular, this was very, for us, we learned this um, from, um, anyway, what we asked them is to analyze the, take the test, analyze the test, point out the problems that are in the text, and try to build a sort of causal relationship between the problems, just to try to map the problems in terms of possible causal relationship among the problems. And the, it was very important for us just uh, to invite students and to guide the students to consider only the problems, not the, positive, the problem, and just to think about the problem and their causal relationship in order to recognize, um, recognize the, the different, different layers, different dimensions, different stakeholders, and just to, to have a picture of the problems. Because the second step of these activities, uh, just as a sort of application of complex system, is to turn what the, we call the problem tree into an objective tree, okay? Turn the, the problems into objectives that can be reached, okay? Goals, objectives. Typically, this is, this is, um, this is just a part of the map. The, the text is rather complex and the text is rather uh, also multidimensional because uh, uh, we took a part of the IPCC uh, map where um, there is not only the, the problem of um, the emissions uh, of the greenhouse gases, but also there are the problems related to the political negotiation, also the sense of vulnerability or stuff like that, and climate migration, the lack of scientific literacy. I mean, there is many different layers because the point was to guide the students to build this problem tree, to turn this into objective tree, and to find the place where they feel much more comfortable take agency or, or where they, they felt much more problematic from them and to take a leverage point to enter this in order to think about their possible uh, uh, agency and activity. So this is, was a sort of a way to develop what we call systemic thinking and to build this uh, and to move from problems to objectives in order to problematize, this is another step, <laughs> To, um, to make the students get aware that a map like that is still very linear, okay? There is still a linear way of organizing the problem. Because the, the other step is to search in the map instead possible feedback loop 
in the in the activity that can be positive or negative feedback loop and just to think about the distinction between the difference between a linear causality where there is one cause and one effect instead of where there is circular causality and uh, and to introduce this further level of complexification this is um, the, the the activities about uh, introduction of complex system and the application of complex system in the analysis of complex text in order to move toward the last part of the modules that is much more focused on future thinking and action competence, I would say, because uh, here typically these are very, these are very uh, creative moment when we invite the students in that to, to, to think about that map and to think about possible problems that for them are particularly uh, serious uh, and just uh, to analyze a, a, a situation in order to, for example, to, and we guide them, for example, to define a problem, to identify a problem that is particularly significant in the present, just to make this map of the problem in terms of causal relationship, and then to try to, to, to turn the, the, the problems into objectives and to, by discovering leverage points, in order to, this is the point, to imagine desirable scenarios. I mean, desi scenarios where the problems that you have analyzed is solved or is somehow addressed in order to, and uh, you know, and, uh, and you can, uh, and, and so as soon as you have this possible desirable scenario, then we invite them also to try to backcast and to think about a possible solution. So this is a um, uh, this is a typical um, this is a typical uh, final activities of these modules, where we invite uh, the students to create a presentation of a success story. We invite them to imagine to be in the 2040 or in the future, and to t to talk in the present, but they are in the future, and to tell the successful story through backcasting and their activities. So this is the the structure of the module. So from an introduction, scientific and epistemological reflection, uh, challenging uh, the linear time uh, and to use uh, and to use uh, these tools in order to learn to read a complex situation and to navigate this complex situation through systemic thinking and creative thinking. Some results. Okay, now we are analyzing a lot of, I mean, we, ha we are, when you have a research, a European project, we are collecting data for uh, many years, and now we are full of data, but this is, uh, this is uh, something that uh, is uh, repeated, uh, is something that is rather systematic, a sort of systematic, uh, typical results that we have. This is a, a this is a, in in an interview at the end of uh, we interview this is a, a student that at the end of the of this module she wrote she she told this is a, this is an interview she she told the project has helped us to think to do something in relation to something else what I learned about shifting from problems to goals impressed me a lot. It also woke me up in the sense that often we perhaps see all the problems and do not even see one positive aspect. With this project, we have seen that things are feasible and they depend on how we act. If we are to focus on one thing, we cannot see it in a global context. Instead, we must always have a vision in which both global and transversal, and then of course, when necessary, we must be able to explore details but always remember the context in which we are. I, I find this uh, very interesting because uh, she understood the sense uh, of, the, of the project because for that, in, instead uh, the problem of the relationship and to, be, to build a big map of the problem, from them it was something that acted at the level of emotional level because uh, it, it is a sort of, uh, activities uh, that touch the sense of fragmentation of the present. You remember at the beginning the problem of the fragmentation of the event, the sense of you don't have criteria to decide where you are in the world, where are the problems, how the problems are connected. 
to have the feeling that there is a sort of something that is connected, there is a possibility to build a map in some sense, is something that touch their sense of agency also, because they change their perception of the, of the complexity of the world. So the sense of the relationship, this is typical of systemic thinking, just to have the feeling of a system, the network, a feeling of systemic thinking, is that is something that touch also their... Um, and another, another point is that, however, the capacity to move from global to detail. It's not just to have a, a, a global map, but to recognize the position of the details in the global stuff. It's the global, and the global vision that makes sense to the global details. So this dynamics between the details and the system in this back and forth dynamics is something that they got. And this is something that also addressed a sense of frustration. This is also typical of the complex system to move from the detail to the, to the global level and vice versa. Another point that is important is uh, this, uh, uh, this um, tension uh, that is irreducible, uh, but it is something that is important to manage between something that is uh, uh, something that is in the future, but also that you can act in the present. So this dialogue between something that is possible to change in the future, but this dynamic dimension between present and future, not only from the taste to global, but also from the present to the future. Another aspect that I think it is more, that acted at a very, very um, important level is to move, uh, is to, to, to use, to, to change the language from the problem to the goal, just to, to use uh, your analytical uh, abilities to create a map of the problem in order to turn then the problem into possible objectives, in possible goals, and just to have the perception that you are not able, of course, to solve the problem, but this is not, but just to think that you can enter the problem and you what you can do it can be interpreted in terms of part of the system this is something that uh, we observed in many of these uh, in this uh, in this um, in these uh, implementations and uh, we uh, observed this um, pattern of attitude in terms uh, that uh, at the end of this uh, modules the students uh, commented that, that uh, the, the project and the modules was help them to widen their perspective, but also it uh, helped them to, to feel the, the future approachable at the level of their imagination, thinking. It was also uh, something that could be addressed through concrete actions uh, and uh, also that they could be agents. So they, they, this sense of widening, widening in terms of possibilities, in terms of knowledge, in terms of possible roles of, uh, of the different stakeholders, uh, and, uh, and uh, instead of the, to, uh, to widen the range of possible action. So it, it seems like a sort of paradox, but widening the possibilities became something that makes the future much more approachable and much more uh, close to their possibility of action. So this dy the dynamics of widening and approaching became something that, that we observed many, many times. And this also was something that for them was very important because it taught, um, typically, as I, I told you, also the students tend to see the future as a sort of uh, funnel. Also, the, the, the process of decision making is perceived something that is just cutting opportunity, just cutting possibilities. And this is another source of anxiety. Instead, to think about the future in terms of possibility and instead of uh, is something also that uh, acts at very different level for, for students' perception of, of time and students' perception of their agency. And uh, another work that we did, uh, also this is um, a paper that we have published, so you, you, can, uh, you can see the methodological detail uh, that we, and the methodological procedure that we used in order to point out uh, this, is, uh, however, a way to recognize what we call the future scaffolding skills. I mean, kind of skills 
that have been developed through these uh, modules. We call them future scaffolding skills because they are both systemic thinking, so they build a scaffolding to, put, to, to push the imagination forward, <laughs> just to create the scaffolding to put your imagination forward and come back. And also uh, analyzing a lot of artifacts, analyzing a lot of students' uh, interviews and questionnaires and stuff like that. Also, it was important for us that educating to the future, it was important to develop these structural skills, systemic skills. Systemic skills because they have, it is, for, it was important to create this uh, capacity to make, to create maps and to organize the present also in order to, and this can be done in different ways, just distinguishing between what are the, uh, some specific disciplinary details and just the much more complex and the uh, other details or, for example, to see the parts but also the whole and the, causal, the system in terms of causal relationship and, uh, and other different kind of relationship. But also, um, future scaffolding skills indeed are, as soon as you have this scaffold, this maps, thinking in terms of future, it means that to in order to keep always open this dynamics between thinking locally and thinking globally, thinking in the present and thinking in the, in the future, also to, to manage the tension between individual dimension and collective dimension, the, the dynamic between imagining new possibilities, but also to don't forget concrete action and to combine these different dimensions, and also to balance uh, the need of aspiring and desiring and that to keeping the feet on the ground in terms of um, dynamical skills, also in terms of a dialectical uh, dialogue among different disciplines and different forms of knowledge, and also to keep uh, this open the, di the dialogue between things in terms of necessity and in terms of possibilities. So this is uh, these are what we call dynamical thinking skills because they all refer to tensions between what they appear dilemma or paradox in order to avoid polarization of thinking, not to think about future without thinking of the present, thinking about creative stuff without thinking about concrete action, just to try to avoid any kind of polarization and to keep the complexity as it is. So this is uh, this, uh, the combination of structural thing skills and dynamical skills is uh, also within uh, Fedora. Is, uh, this is the last uh, slide. Is, uh, just, um, this is another motto within uh, Fedora when you have to deal with these complex systems just to, and to, in order to avoid polarization, just to create an attitude when you have to keep together sense making and just to try a way to make a structure to develop systemic thinking but also strange making challenging the structure challenging think out of the possibility to to keep together a sense of comfort your bubble but also thinking out of your comfort zone just this combination of uh, uh, these different feelings and different emotion is something that is part of science also this is a sort of uh, this is a sort of quotation also of the complementary principle of Niels Bohr to try to keep together things that appear to be contradictory, but instead they are irreducible tension that we have to manage in order to, in order to deal with this complex situation. This is another, quest, another quote from Daniel. It's a, and he, at the end of the of the module, he said, talking about the future in an uncertainty present already assumes the value of a promise. And that was for us also very nice because um, they started from another vision of the future where future was not a promise, but a threat. A threat. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Olivia, very much for a very nice and inspired talk. I really enjoy. I have listened to you before, but this time maybe I uh, I have more. 
elements to understand the kind of research you have made with your group. And uh, okay, we start with the questions, uh, comments, and, and I would like just to say for the people that are uh, following us by YouTube, that you can also make uh, questions using the email. Uh, they, I will say in Portuguese, uh, IEA responde. Exatamente assim, IEA, né, que seria o código do Instituto de Estudos Avançados, responde arroba usp.br se vocês tiverem perguntas é só mandar e eu vou ler as perguntas aqui e a Olivia responde ok, uh, então let's pass through the questions uh, I think we have another microphone there, yes who would like to start? Ok. Gil? Tá, eu sou o Gilberto, podem me chamar de Gil. So, professor, you actually told about something I was going to ask before the presentation. So, uh, given your extensive work in integrating advanced artificial top into educational contexts, how do you foresee the role of emerging technology, like artificial intelligence, and quantum computing in shaping the future science education. And also, how should educators and researchers prepare to integrate this technology into curricula to keep pace with the society acceleration? <laughs> the question for the million? Okay. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, um, we are we um, as you as you as you saw also we 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 have developed a, 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 a modular with the same structure a modular artificial intelligence and a module on quantum technologies and uh, exactly with the with the same structure and uh, and it is very interesting to um, I don't know how where to start to to think but. In particular, in the module of artificial intelligence, uh, we use the, the comparison between the different uh, coding uh, paradigm uh, just to, to show the, the really the, the kind of revolution that machine learning and deep learning in particular introduced because uh, the distinction between uh, a, a classical uh, procedural algorithm uh, or also logical paradigm of, uh, and instead the deep learning paradigm Deep, 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 the deep learning perspective is exactly the same change of the of parad of perspectives that is from the determinism, Newtonian concept of time with the, a sense of complexity because also you can model a neural network as a complex system, of course, and there is also this kind of attitude. And also, uh, so the, 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 the um, we, I don't know how to, how to answer about this question, but we, um, it can be follow the same uh, part, the same structure to deal with the artificial intelligence and to, and to discuss with the students about the change in the epistemological, also uh, in the epistemological perspective that is induced by the artificial intelligence. And also the complex system in this case is very useful to think about how artificial intelligence is impacting uh, our way of being. It's not, uh, and it's challenging this illusion that it is a tool, that is something that you can dominate. And, and instead, this circular dynamics between human, artificial, the sense of creativity is something that if you use the complex system, if you use a, a different perspective, you can problematize a lot of illusion that you can control, that, that you can control and you, that you can, uh, and you can deal artificial intelligence as a tool, okay, as a tool. Instead, it is something that is changing deeply there. And for the quantum technology also, there is the same, uh, the same uh, problem and the same, uh, and quantum physics in particular is wonderful to think about the change in this temporal structure because, uh, because the language and the mathematical model of quantum physics is gold. <laughs> to, to think about possible evolution of systems uh, and uh, 
Um, for the artificial intelligence, uh, uh, this is crazy because um, this is very interesting because uh, the module was, we started to develop the module with the teachers of the group. And then we uh, also implemented this module in a class. And now this module is uh, becoming something that the school per se is developing without the university. And this, uh, and it is, uh, beca it became a, a way to trigger a new dynamics among the teachers because it is very interdisciplinary. So now this school, this is a school in Rimini in particular, that uh, this module on artificial intelligence with this approach is involving teachers from all the disciplines. And this is something that is really impacting also at the level of the, uh, at the level of their curricular studies because, uh, because uh, these teachers are, act are activating a new way to relate to each other, to discuss to each other, to use this also to think about their pedagogical model. And we are following this institution, and this is what I was talking about. Uh, we are following it, the kind of institutional impact of this kind of module because school is mainly, some made by the relationship among the teachers. And if you use knowledge to change and to create a new boundary context, boundary zone, uh, to find new way to discuss, this is something that's really changing them. And also art, uh, the, the teacher of arts and uh, philosophy, yeah. Okay, uh, I think half uh, have been hand just take the microphone because the, the people are not listening on YouTube. Um, actually, it's part comment, part, part question. And um, the first thing I thought, Olivia, after, after reading what, what you've written actually on, on this, um, is that I, I thought this was a very contemporary article for young people. But then I was thinking about it, and I thought, well, young people have always had this, not young people, but actually everyone has always had this problem over the last couple of centuries, industrialization, world wars, nuclear threats, and so on. This is not a, a contemporary problem. This is actually quite a historic yeah. problem. Um, so that's what struck me particularly, as you quoted people like Toffler and Walter Benjamin, who obviously are very much the early, you know, mid and early part of the 20th century. So it struck me as, this is not just new. This is about how things ought to have been some time ago. And then I thought, I was thinking, well, actually, maybe what you're talking about is much more relevant for adults than for mm. young people. Because it's actually adults who are experienced. I mean, my children grew up in an age where most cell phones, you could communicate across the world straight away. I grew up in an age where we had old-style telephones. Zoom was unimaginable at that time. I mean, I'm the kind of person who's really having problems adjusting to this new world. And so it struck me that a lot of what you've got to say actually has almost more pertinence to adults than it does to young people who are co you know, can cope with, with what's, what's happening in a way. And the third point I want to add is, was um, I, I threw in front of you Carlos Rovelli's book um, on time, um, you know, on, on the quantum physicist Carlo Rovelli. I, I waved his book in front of you. And he says exactly the same. We, the, the young, young people, the, the, the problem is we've been prisoners of Newtonian science. And he's arguing that Aristotelian physics which would be much more relevant, much more useful for young people than Newtonian mechanics. But I think he has also a lot of lessons which are completely reflective of what you're saying, at looking at time in quantum terms and space-time and seeing how you know that time is not just a concrete thing. So um, really resonated. And uh, I was just thinking also of um, the uh, of sociologist, uh, Bat, um, ba Bauman, Bauman, who talks about liquid society and the, the sudden movement of money. I mean, he talks about financial markets and how money suddenly moved around the world like that, whereas 20, 30 years before, this was a slow process and how we all had to adapt to that. So it does. So I want to make a plea for your work <laughs> to be relevant to older people as well as younger people. But, I, I, you know, I think it's doing a fantastic job. You are right, but indeed the problem is um, 
that we are forcing the young people to follow our institutions. They are not for them. So we are creating prisons for them. And we complain where they complain. They, are, they really, they are suffering because they are prison. I mean, they are in, in, in a so rigid structure that doesn't make it is not uh, adequate for our society. And we, con we are convincing them that the problem is that they are not able to make their plan. So we are inducing a structure and, uh, on them that is completely, I mean, it was modeled for another society. And a society that, that we had, ex even if it is an old problem, I have, we grew up in a sense of a progress. We have the we have the experience of what does it mean to prepare ourselves for a better future. We have this feeling. They don't have this feeling. But they are following a, an educational system that is still built as that. And they feel they are not able to do that. They, they are not able to recognize this kind of uh, misalignment between our educational system and the society. As, This reminds me so much of Hannah Arendt yes, made a statement course. that um, we, the tyranny of education, that we don't allow the, the young to grow up in a world of their own making. We, the older generation, impose their own, they've gone ours, so completely reflective, yeah. And I'm worried because actually, also, the sense of really, Hannah Arendt, but also, I mean, the sense of the moment of being, I mean, this is something that our generation, the sense of the epiphany, the sense of the, 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 the perception that in some moment you are aligned in a, in a, in a particular space and time moment where we are, you are aligned with a path, a, a personal trajectory. This is an experience that is more and more rare among these two. This is something that is, for me, is something that... And, this is worrying because uh, because they're burning out and the sense of uh, uh, mental uh, uh, disease, I mean, is is so large. And also, I don't know, I'm not a sociologist, I don't know, but I feel guilty when <laughs> I teach physics in that way because I know that I'm teaching in a way that I'm not preparing them for uh, Okay, someone else, please, don't be ashamed. Aurea, on the back, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Olivia. Uh, I would like to hear you about, uh, you told about the internal, external, meanings of times, different times. I was thinking about, and I would like to hear you, about the new technologies, not only AI, but the digitalization of the society. Why I am asking you about this? Because the internal time is more and more uh, coordinated by these elements the wearables in health, uh, and so on. Biotechnology to reproduction, and so on. So I think uh, one of uh, the suffering of the new generations and, uh, and us is that because there is no more external and internal uh, thinking about specifically this kind of technologies, and I would like to hear you about this. Yeah, this is not, not my field. Probably you are much more uh, expert in this, but I, I was thinking about the other book of Armut Rosa about resonances, OK? And when we, he described exactly this sense of um, this uh, kind of uh, dissonances, <laughs> OK? Uh, that are in, 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 this, uh, in the relationship with the nature, with the others, and with the self, the self uh, just because of this uh, 
the implication of acceleration in terms of hyper connectivity and this uh, hyper, we are really in this hyper inf uh, full of information and this richness of information of the of the of the of our society so i i, I don't i don't know I, I don't know exactly this but i, I mean he is uh, relating a lot of uh, the, this uh, he called this the crisis in the environmental crisis, but also the crisis the social uh, democ the crisis in the democracy, but also the crisis the psychological crisis in terms of this implication of the digitalization and this hyper connected the technologies uh, hyper connected the era. I don't know how to um, how to answer about this because I don't know the the, the, the I just know that. Um, discussing with the student about uh, physical system in a lab and also to think about this internal dynamics of the system and to open them the possibility that there is an internal Italo Calvino, an Italian writer, talked about uh, the, the, the mental velocity that is another velocity of, uh, it is an internal velocity of thinking, internal way of thinking, just open to open down the possibility that there is this, this is what we can do, okay? And the other, this is other, uh, other uh, I don't know, in other sense, but he stressed this, uh, this point, uh, the, the problem of uh, the reduction of the internal time, but also as cause of a lot of psychological difficulties just because of, because of that. This is what he said. From a physical point of view, you just can uh, problematize. Cristiano and after Cristina. So, Olivia, thank you for your beautiful and complex talk. Uh, a lot of things to think about. I was wondering if you ha you have in the in the project some follow up about how people uh, after this the, do the the models in their own lives if they change their way of thinking they also change the way of being after the the, the models. Uh, this in this moment we are following one person in particular we are doing a longitudinal study. Of, uh, of one case because of course this is comp this is not easy to but um, we are doing now a long uh, uh, a long study we are following one person <laughs> and um, because uh, because it was particular I mean she, she was she is a girl uh, she was particularly able to express also to, to be very explicit about the, the process and to, to interact with the other and also so for us it was important to follow her thinking and their way to re-elaborate and to readapt and to use this thinking for for that, for her so we are using a, a simple case to start just to have an idea of what is, can be possible of course not in a very statistical uh, way, but instead, uh, instead we are following the teachers. This is something we are following. Uh, I mean, it's ten years that we are following the same teachers and to understand what is the kind of change that this kind of work is producing for them, for the school, for the students. This is uh, this is. Um... Christina. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, your talk. I I have and I, I think I, I had uh, many things in my mind, but uh, one that I think uh, I would like to ask is in the same line of uh, half asking. I would like to know if uh, this kind of uh, theory or uh, do you think? like he said more about adult and I think if it's the same if you compare rich person with the poor person because sometimes I think for poor person we are constantly in uncertainty moment and it's difficult to say that just now we are having this uh, I don't know uh, it's, it's something that you already think about thank you yeah, in, in this sense, I think that, uh, yeah, in, in this sense, uh, I think that our sample, I mean, uh, our 
context is uh, this is not the main uh, i mean luckily we i mean in our context there is not this so big uh, at least so big uh, instead we are following other kind of um, diversities in the sense of, so for example the it is very well known that time perception is gendered this is something that is uh, different from the not not only yeah this is different from uh, girls and and uh, and the and the boys so this is a kind of differences that we are observing but uh, instead in, not in our studies but instead uh, in the in sociology this is something that is very very analyzed because and they talk also about color the, the terms of col colonializing future also the future is colonialized and also there are um, it is very interesting i mean there are important studies that study how the capacity to aspire is just a privilege just the, the capacity to and it is something that there are a lot less privileged uh, community uh, they don't have either the, the capacity to think about desirable future not they don't think about it so this is something that is not, not in our little specific cases that are just uh, but this is something that is deeply uh, studied and uh, it is also a, a very big topic in the community of foresight just to think how the perception of the future is per se a matter of uh, just thinking about the future is uh, is uh, something that is a privilege and the way of but also from this point of view i think um, i think that there is a lot of a richness there because also the women perspective i mean the genders perspective enlarge the possibility of thinking about the future that is really challenging the one way to think of the future of the model we are complexifying that way of thinking of the future so this kind of debate is really enriching the, the perspective and uh, it is uh, so not not in our specific case i can just mention some studies juliano ah but Olivia, thank you so much for your presentation. Like it's really, really inspiring, and we have a lot of to think about. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, it's not a question. I want to, I would like to know if you know how you are framing the epistemological debate inside this project, because uh, in the same way that traditional physics thinks about um, concepts of the past, like what we knew. Epistemology is like very in tra traditional way, like very similar, and how we knew basically something. So my question: How do you think about epistemologies for the future? New ways to understand things that are coming to be. For example, I'm, I'm not sure if I make myself clear, but how do you? What epistemologies are you using to to frame this debate about new concepts? This is this is um, I don't know. This is very. Um, but I, I I don't know if I don't know if it is an answer. But I conceptualize this stuff that uh, indeed um, um, when we if you talk about epistemology, just learning from the past and just to 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 use history, okay, to as a critical dimension to think about. Uh, knowledge and to think about the evolution of knowledge okay but uh, uh, if you think about the other side from the other side from the future instead of looking in terms of what happened in terms of instead of what can happen on what it could happen and it didn't happen there is also and it is also interesting because uh, there is um, a field, I don't remember, I mean, there is a sort of epistemology about the perception of time, a perception of the future in the past. So also the sense of the future can be analyzed historically in some sense. 
But I think that the, 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 the epistemology I'm talking much more about is the epistemology of the possibilities. How to uh, conceptualize uh, uh, the sense of probability, the sense of, uh, the sense of possibilities, uh, and to move from the epistemology of an idea of science as necessity to a sense of science as possibility. It is already there. I mean, it is, it is in the practice of science. But to conceptualize, the, for example, the change of the concept of, for example, I don't know if it is the answer, but a, a, a wonderful activities that we, just my students organized two, two, two months ago with the students was a sort of analysis of the different concept of uncertainty in, uh, in, uh, in science. So from uncertainty, from the experimental uncertainty to uh, quantum uh, uncertainty, the Heisenberg principle and uncertainty in the complex systems. And also, okay, just, just for example, to see and to see how, for example, the IPCC uh, documents elaborated and changed their language to talk about possibilities and probability. This is an higher layer that is not exactly to talk about the future, but is an epistemological part because we are thinking about the knowledge that we are producing in order to manage uncertainty, for example. So this is, for me, a, a, a kind of a way, a way to talk about, about the, the, the future, for example. Also, um, anyway, there was another layer of uh, Ah. Uh, within uh, within the, um, uh, the uh, in climate change uh, in climate change field and in particular in the disaster science the science of disaster okay the, the, the science of the extreme events uh, for example now there is a new field that is called the, the storyline approach that has a completely different epistemology with respect, for example, to the risk, ah, to the risk-based approach. This is something that can be interesting also for, for you. I didn't, uh, I didn't talk about this. Because the risk-based approach, okay, is a something that is analyzed the risk in terms of probability of that something happen or not happen. Also. And so in the terms of the cone, okay, it thinks in terms much more in terms of from the past or present to the, to the future. Okay. The storyline approach that is developed in UK in a reading by Shepard, and they try to analyze instead, they change the perspective, they start, they think about plausible, just plausible extreme event that can happen. They assume that they, with the probability of one, as they were done, okay, and then try to instead to recognize what was happened in terms of a sort of back casting activities. And they are thinking that in order to present and to discuss the extreme event locally through this time, different time perspective has a much more uh, impact at the political level because it uh, it activates another kind of thinking in the people in the citizen in the policy maker because uh, it, it push imagination toward there in the in the activity and you you, you can think about different kind of uh, priorities for example so also this what's happening mm -hmm. ah so this is also this is also another layer to activate a sense of and the, um, and Noemi or for example the, the 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 why we trust science and this is what she she made a very interesting analysis of the different epistemological perspectives from the risk based research a risk based approach to the storyline approach so also this is another layer to to just you allow me to just to make a common remark uh, i think uh, in our traditional epistemological perspective approach uh, normally uh, science has tried to show us what kind of thing doesn't exist in the future it means that it was a kind of uh, uh, a knowledge that uh, filtered possibilities and say uh, for example when you you, you, you make, for example, a rock that is launched. launched. What, what do you expect to do? Uh, they arrived in this point, and when you say that, you 
avoid completely other possibilities. Maybe you will have a kind of uncertainty, but the uncertainty is just your misleading possibilities to say exactly what. And I think uh, we have other possibilities in terms of epistemology. You can, you can imagine a kind of knowledge that they are not uh, intent as to say what cannot be done. But sometimes they show you what the possibilities you have for these other things to happen. It may be statistical or just maybe a, a, possi a possible way of thinking using imagination. I think it's about this kind of, uh, I think it's a change in, in epistemological terms. For that reason, uh, uh, Olivia used epistemology, changing epistemological roots. It means that it's also a, a, a possible use of knowledge because we continue to have the idea of future. And it's important to say that in many other traditions, the idea of future could not be present. For example, in a, in a circular uh, perspective of time, future does not exist because the things are repeat, repeat, repeat. But in our perspective, future exists. But in this traditional line of epistemology, it's a kind of deterministic line and you cut completely other possibilities. Just, just uh, sorry, one, but um, I don't know if we are in the same, but it's <laughs> historically, traditionally, the philosophy of science and epistemology was really built on physics, as it was. It's not by chance that now the probably the most interesting philosophical and epistemological reflection are based on other sciences like biology or evolution or stuff like that because they are fields that they are able to produce a new way of evolution, the complexity and the systemic thinking. So probably also that is a field where... Uh... Uh, let me make a comment. Uh, Giuliano, I, I think that the epistemology of the future is a good question. but. All our discussion seems that we don't have any intentionality. I, I'm, I'm wondering about the axiology of the future. What values we will value in the future? So we have some intentions. So science is not a just uh, a, a just open uh, doors for us. We are open this door in some directions with some values. And uh, it's not uh, science. It's not just the epistemology giving opportunities to humankind to to uh, to uh, go in some ways. We are choosing. That's that's the. It's curious because I I, I didn't saw the word hope. I think that's the one of the important uh, words to to talk about future. Because this is the direction, this is the values. That's, I think that in the cone, when you see desirable, it's, co it's inside of desirable of these questions of what I want to do in the future, what I want the future is. Not just what science is, is capable to give me. So that imposes choices and explicitly say our values and I don't know, it's just a cone. Sorry. Bom, eu vou falar em português. <risos> e o Maurício e o, e, o, e o Cristiano que traduzo, porque vai um pouco na direção do Cristiano, eu já nem ia comentar muito essa ideia, que é o, a ideia de futuro. Uh, speaking about the idea que a escolha of né, of de, um, de um referencial bem concreto para isso, mas sem a ideia de história. Quer dizer, o que me... O que me deixa um pouco, não vou dizer incomodada, mas deixa um pouco preocupada, é que seja possível falar tanto em futuro sem falar em história. Claro, estão ligadas, mas não são muito diferentes desses dois conceitos, né? essas duas ideias, essas duas aproximações. E, se você quiser até bem pegar dentro do próprio sistema complexo, do sistema complexo, o que é, o que é o futuro? O que é a história? São conceitos e ideias muito diferentes. Então, é, é um pouco nessa linha que eu, é, que 
que eu queria ouvir um pouquinho por que não falar em história. Desculpe falar em português. É, não, I, I will not translate. I'm thinking about it. So the problem is the concept of history. No, that's the point. If history is a, just a, a, a set of facts or is open reality. No, no, here the, the, the futurists really do a lot of history, really analyze the past in a very specific way, just for example to understand the change and evolution, not focus on the cumulative aspect necessarily or to the past, but how the, to, to analyze the mechanism of change. So history is very important as a, as a source of knowledge in order to understand what are the, and not only, mm, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, one, of, one book that is, I think, very inspiring for us is called, is from the Jürgen Rahn, I told him, he is the director of the Max Planck Institute of the History of Science, okay, and he just recently uh, published a book uh, that is called The Evolution of Knowledge, and it is very interesting because he positioned science as a very special form of knowledge within the evolution of knowledge of the humanity. And also that, just to problematize how it was possible to have that particular form of science in, in, in that, in, in some, so also science is, uh, um, and how it can be evolved. So just the, uh, uh, history is uh, for for future is absolutely important. It, it depends on what you notice in the future, or in the past, in terms of change. There is also the the study of the historical studies about the concept of utopia and hope, because also this is an historical uh, concept. I, I mean the the hope, the kind of wishes, the hope uh, and the and the the sense of utopia, I mean, utopian studies, they are just, just to understand how it evolved in the history, this concept of a utopian future, okay? And hope, active hope, harmful hope, is now, for example, one of the call, that is the, the last call of uh, this conference on anticipation in the future uh, field, of just because hope is another tricky word, because it is, can be very nuanced. Some hope can be just uh, something that is a devolution. Uh, there is an active hope that is completely different, but also harmful hope uh, that can be. So this is, I didn't mention it, but it is, uh, of course, uh, a key word. OK, I think we have time for one more question. Ernani, you will close the session. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Ernani. I'm from Federal University of Spiritu Santo because people are uh, watching YouTube. Well, Olivia, um, my thought and maybe a question is on the teaching dimension of the particular idea you presented before in your talk. And thank you for your talk, of course, because I was processing a lot of stuff in my head. But one of that was about the time in that tension between Kronos and Kairos. And um, I don't know if you have, have some uh, perspective for teaching on that, but when I think about myself during the pandemic time, my, my sort of uh, chirological perception is that those two and a half years, they just didn't exist. And I feel myself in, in my internal uh, thoughts and feelings and set of events, it was the, before the lockdown, the, the heavy lockdown, and then the, the time, uh, the, the, the moment after. Of course, this is not chronological because it was several months between one and another point. But how can we think about future in a chirological perspective when teaching that? Because 
Of course, I know that in, in this, this discussion about not only the external time as an external structure upon my, my agency uh, uh, need to be brought to discussion because through my internal uh, sense of time, I know, for example, that changes that I want to idealistically contribute in education, they have like a chirological perspective that in a chronological sense can take decades. But maybe it's only one event, one small piece of sand event in my chirological sense. And I was thinking, how, how can I think about teaching future in the internal time perspective? I don't know if, if, if I make myself uh, clear on that. You mean uh, chirological aspect does, does don't have a directionality? I'm curious about how, how to think directionality in I, I mean, I was wondering how to think the, the future, the, the time arrow in a chirological sense. I, I, I couldn't think a way of doing that. Actually, paradoxically, entropy <laughs> is what enters the, the, the arrow of time. Uh, and in some sense, it's not uh, the chrono, it's not Newtonian time that enters the, the arrow of time. So in, in this sense, the, the, physics, uh, the, the answer from physics is rather easy. If we want to turn <laughs> this answer to, to, to a personal perception, um, uh, okay. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I. I'm not sure. I. I, I got it. But uh, um, for example, um, when we. I, I don't know if I. This is just a, a connection. I'm not. I'm not sure about it. Um, uh, with with a student of a master student of mine. This is what I'm thinking. We are uh, working about epistemic emotions. Okay, just a sense of feeling the present and feeling the future. Just a sense of what is the feeling of directionality and what is the feeling of the present. Just to stay in the present, but this feeling that something is happening that is you feel that you are. And and this is also uh, this is interesting because it's before rationality, before becoming, before the plan, before planning, before doing, you have the feeling uh, that something is happening uh, in, uh, in uh, also in, in your learning, okay? Just, I, I'm thinking about learning and something like, like that. So just uh, something that you are, you got, you're not stuck, but this is something that happening even if uh, you don't have the progression that is measured in terms of performance, in terms of something like that. This is the, and it's very interesting because uh, the, the main source for understanding the epistemological uh, emotions in terms of the feeling of direction is Einstein. Einstein uh, uh, had a wonderful uh, interview, a wonderful um, uh, discussion in terms of the description of his creative moment. And just to describe how he had the, the perception of that something changed, uh, what was the chirological moment that make him the feeling that there was a feeling of direction before finding the solution, before uh, thinking about just this feeling. So this is another very interesting, I think, field of uh, analysis. And also for the students, it's very important to analyze the learning, the moments of learning in terms uh, of emotion, but not emotion, in just in terms of epistemic emotion, where there is the creative moment of learning where you have the feeling that you are in the right direction. And this is also, a, I'm just thinking about this connection because I, this is just very old reading. And for example, it was there was an interesting study in uh, mathematics education that demonstrated that uh, the, the student, they are very, very, we are talking about primary students, primary school students. And they, they found a sort of correlation between the difficulties in solving exercises in mathematics with the students who had some family problems in particular because they were not able to think about the future. Because also solving a problem, you have to anticipate the solution in order to address the problem. So this game to put the imagination before and to have the feeling of the reaction also in the moment of learning, in the moment of solving 
a problem becomes important because if you follow the, the chronological, the linear solution, this is what the school teaches. But, but if you instead uh, also in the problem, so in the exercises, you think about how to activate this feeling uh, of an the anticipation of the solution before searching for the, the, the way. This is also another uh, another moment of being, where the moment of the the eureka moment, where you, it, it is a play between the future and the and the present. Okay, uh, I like to finish this session. Thank you, Olivia, very much for a very inspired talk, and invite you to have a coffee break.